It's Professor Dave. Let's find maxima and minima. He knows a lot about all kinds of stuff. Professor Dave explains. By now, we have a solid concept of differentiation, what it is and how to do it with a variety of functions. So let's continue to learn about some applications for differentiation. How is it useful and what can it tell us about a function? Well, if a function looks like this with local maxima and minima, then a derivative can be very useful in figuring out where those are exactly. Let's recall that if a derivative can be interpreted as the slope of a tangent line, and the tangent line at any maximum or minimum must be perfectly horizontal, then the derivative of a function at any of these points must equal zero. So to find them, all we need to do is take the derivative and find the zeros of the derivative. There are countless applications for this, and we will go over many of them a little later when we look at optimization problems. For now, let's not worry about application. Let's just get some practice in finding these values. Of course, some functions have no maxima or minima. Take x cubed, for example. This function is constantly increasing as we move left to right, from negative infinity to positive infinity, so there are no maxima or minima to speak of. Some functions have absolute maxima and minima. This would be something like sine of x. This function will never be greater than 1, which is its value at any input that is half pi plus or minus any multiple of 2 pi. Likewise, it will never be less than negative 1, which is its value at any of these inputs. So these are absolute maxima and minima. If we zoom in on a specific portion, we can identify a local or relative maximum or minimum, but this will repeat in either direction. Some functions instead will have a finite number of local maxima or minima. This is just the highest or lowest point on the curve in a particular section, which we can identify as any point where the function changes direction. Let's look at the function x cubed minus 3x squared plus 1. There is one local maximum and one local minimum. Where do these occur? Well, as we said, let's take the derivative. That will be 3x squared minus 6x. We can factor out a 3x from both terms to get 3x times x minus 2. Now we want to find the input values for which this derivative equals 0 because those will be the points on the function with horizontal tangent lines. Well, this is just basic algebra. If x is 0, f prime is 0. If x is 2, f prime is 0. So the local maximum occurs at x equals 0, and the local minimum occurs at x equals 2. Of course, that one was pretty simple, so let's try one more for practice. What about x over the quantity x squared plus 1? Again, we must take the derivative, and for that we need the quotient rule. Remember, it's bottom times the derivative of the top, minus top times the derivative of the bottom, over bottom squared. Here, that gives us this. And we can simplify to get negative x squared plus 1 on top. Now remember, to find the zeros of a rational function like this one, we just need to find the zeros of the numerator, since zero over anything is zero. So let's set negative x squared plus 1 equal to zero. We rearrange to get x squared equals 1, take the square root of both sides, and x must be equal to plus or minus 1. That means that x equals negative 1 and 1 will give local maxima or minima on the function. And in fact, the function looks like this. So this is one great application of differentiation. In algebra, we learned how to get a rough sketch of a higher degree polynomial by finding the end behavior and its zeros. But it was always a pretty rough sketch, as we never knew precisely how far above or below the x-axis to go after each pass. But now we can even find local maxima and minima and then evaluate the function at these input values, which gives us additional important points on the curve. 
So this new trick really allows us to draw near flawless graphs for even these tricky higher degree functions. Speaking of graphing functions, let's revisit this in the context of calculus. But first, let's check comprehension. Thanks for watching guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.